turned, I hit my go button before I even had my monitor turned on. That's silly. That's never happened before. All right, I'll turn you at me for just a minute so you can see my wonderful face. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> like all old people, I want to put a footnote or a caveat underneath my picture like, I used to be young. <laughs> I used to be good looking. <laughs> now I'm smart. Never mind. I'm just being silly. Anyway, hello, my name is Dan. Maybe you know that already. And this is Daily Art Adventure number 959. Can you believe it? Coming up close to a thousand. And I've called it Experiments in Masking Day 2. So you can see Experiments in Masking Day 1, of course, was yesterday. Yesterday afternoon. And let me point you. And again, trying to, try to get this. A document printed out for you so that I can uh, do a little bit of uh, abstract teaching in the course of this. Let's just make it draft quality so it'll come up off the printer more quickly. All right, so here's a pretty small canvas. I didn't want to waste a big canvas. I didn't want the pressure of feeling like I had to produce a masterpiece. As it is right now, I'm I'm pretty happy with it uh, as an abstract painting. And uh, let me go, I'll go ahead and give you a few of my thoughts about abstract painting. First of all, the document that will be here in just a couple seconds. There we go. There it is. And I, and I believe that I have. Uh, published this on my community page. Six categories of abstract, or more strictly speaking, non-objective paintings. Hang on. Hang on. Evidently I made a mistake. <laughs> my printer's printing off three or four of these. All right, here are the categories. Material-oriented or material-focused abstract paintings. Movement or kinesthetic-focused or oriented abstracts, process-oriented, design-oriented, image-oriented, that requires some explanation, and chance-oriented. Okay, image means here's some exam very, very, very famous examples. One is Robert Indiana. He had two blockbuster famous images. One was the word love. Another was he used the numeral five, the number five. But please understand, when Robert Indiana is painting the letters L-O-V-E. It is not a painting of the word love, contrary to what most non-artists, I suppose, would think. No, no, no. It's a painting in which he was using the symbols, the letters L-O-V-E and the word L-O-V-E, but he was using those as abstract elements to create. Here's another example. Um, when uh, Andy Warhol did his famous Campbell soup cans or, or um, Marilyn Monroe or Elvis or anything, he was not doing, he, this is not a portrait of Marilyn Monroe. Again, contrary to what I'm sure some non-artists would think, oh, what else is it? Well, I, no, no, he's using the, the icon, the symbol, the abstract. See, it works the same, just as well upside down when you can't recognize uh, 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 Marilyn Monroe. Anyway, so that's image oriented. I'm assuming that most of this other stuff is self-explanatory. And then the question here at the bottom is, so which is the best category? Material, movement, process, design-oriented, image-oriented, or chance-oriented? My answer is all six. So the more that your abstract painting can employ all six of these, the likelihood that it's a good composition is more likely. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you um, this is not a material-oriented abstract because... I'm just using paint, plain old ordinary, you know, nothing special about paint. So you can't say, yeah, yeah, paint, it's an abstract, and paint is my thing. No, 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 paint is everybody's thing, so you don't get that category. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, now, uh, my abstracts tend to be, I'll go ahead and fess up right away, very much kinesthetic or movement oriented. My abstracts have a lot to do, and my big ones especially, with the, the movement of my arms 
in fact, on the big ones, my whole body. Uh, and you can see some of that here, these big slashes and marks, bold, bold marks. So I tend to be kinesthetic and composition. Okay, so there's a lot of compositional elements here. Composition is line, shape, design, value, texture, um, in, in, held in tension, and that gets us into the subject of principles of design, but just the elements of design. Again, line, shape, design, value, color, texture, six essentially elements. Um, and then chance. There's quite a bit of chance, and I'm about to introduce a whole bunch of chance into this particular painting. All right, now let's talk about the experiment I'm doing. Yesterday, and you can go back and watch this yesterday evening, um, I started out, as all my paintings do, in acrylics. So I put down some acrylic marks, and then I put rubber cement on top of some of it, and then I did another layer of acrylic, and then lifted off the rubber cement. And then I did some more rubber cement and some more layers. Okay, so several layers in acrylics experimenting. I wasn't sure how it was going to work. It worked pretty well. My biggest fear was could I actually get all of the rubber cement off the canvas even though it's got acrylics on top of it. And I think the answer was yes. I think so that was pretty successful. Now it gets a lot trickier. Masking oils becomes a lot trickier. In fact I've already I've already learned a lot from this experiment. One is um, in order to really do layers in oil with masking, it could slow down the process a great deal because I can't think of any way to do it without waiting for each layer of oil to dry. So that's essentially what I've done here. I quit painting last night at a certain point and this, this painting still has, so it still has a bunch of wax on it. Okay, I haven't said that yet. Here's what I decided to do my first experiment is I'm playing with encaustic medium, which is beeswax mixed with um, Damar varnish. And I can't smell any varnish. It smells like beeswax to me. It smells wonderful. So I have a hot plate over here behind my easel. Let's see if the, if the glass, no, it's not too hot to pick up. So this has melted wax in it. You can see that? Melted wax, right? And I brushed it on there. And I did two layers of wax last night, but the second layer I left on the canvas. And right now we're going to have the fun of melting it off. Okay, so part of the beauty and fun of um, of masking is I don't know exactly what's going to happen, and that's that's part of the fun. So it's this is this is part of, in my category of abstract painting. This goes largely under the chance focused or chance oriented. By the way, I have Jackson Pollock and his drip paintings as one example of chance. There's many, 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 many others, but that's just the most famous, perhaps. All right, so I have here not a hair dryer, not a hair dryer, okay? It says here nozzle heat exceeds 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not use as a hair dryer. Oh my, I just, I shudder to think, oh my goodness, Lord protect every mom. Who would ever pick this up and point it at her kid? It would just be disastrous. Anyway, so here we go. I'm going to turn this on, and we're going to see you and me together what's going to happen. I don't even know exactly where all the wax is, but I see some right here. So let's start right here. I discovered last night that the heat gun works very well. The wax melts quite readily. At least it did last night. There we go. Yep, yep, yep. So can you see that melting? And of course, where it melts, it, it carries the oil paint that was on top of it. It carries like a mask. It carries that with it, away with it. Okay, now let me stop right there and pick up. Oh, I've got a little bit of a paper, uh, napkin here. So let's let's try this. Let's see what that does. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Let's keep going. I would like to see a, sort of a hard edge, if you will, a, a clear differentiation 
the the effect of a mask. In other words, I would like I would like to see a clear boundary between where the wax was and where the wax wasn't. At the moment, I'm not sure that I'm seeing that. So one of the clear problems with this wax technique is that I would not be able to do it very easily out on the street when I was doing when I'm doing plein air painting. And that would be a a distinct disappointment too. I'm gonna to find a rag, I don't like that. Oh, here's a rag I used yesterday. It's still stiff with wax, so that's good. <laughs> um I would like to be able to do whatever this masking technique is. I would like to be do it do able to do it out in the field, so to speak, when I'm doing plein air painting. And the, uh, the rubber cement and um, and acrylics uh, clearly passed that test. I, I can do the rubber cement thing. Huh. This is interesting. So, no, I am not getting... Um, a clear differentiation, as I was saying earlier, between the um, the masked areas and the unmasked areas. Yeah, no, I am not. A little, a little tiny bit. For some reason, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a tiny bit of wax. Okay, now they're right there. You can see that's that's a clear mask pattern. And that's kind of what I was hoping for. But it seems like when I heat, as I'm heating the uh, the wax, it, it feels as though I'm heating the oil paint as well, and it's rubbing off um, along with the wax. So I'm taking off more paint than, than I would like. Not a disaster, but it, Somebody suggested, one of you suggested last night that I try, um, oh, what was that, um, silicone in a, in a tube. I, I, and you could buy a little squeeze tube of silicone as well. Maybe, maybe, but generally speaking, that takes a while to dry also. Now, the other thing I wonder is what's happening here. This is my second layer of uh, wax that I put on last night. And I wonder if I'm also melting, remelting my my first layer of wax. You know, I thought I had wiped it off, but it's possible. But that, that there were tiny vestiges of uh, wax still left from my first masking. Now, my idea behind this experiment... Okay, let me back up. Why am I experimenting? Okay, some of you weren't with me yesterday. Um, I have been on a path, a very conscious um, journey for, for the last seven or eight years in my normal painting. Which, you know, most of my painting is cityscapes, although in the last five months I've done a lot more portraits than anything else I counted yesterday I've done uh, 24 portraits plus three dog portraits plus one or, or two or three <laughs> wait I just realized no no I've done 27 I just re remembered last night one image that I did 27 portraits three dog portraits and three portraits of people at a distance, so more like figurative. Anyway, in the last five months, so if you count the dogs, 
that's 30 portraits in the last five months so not too bad but my normal most common painting is cityscapes and i've been on this trajectory for seven or eight years to get more accurate more tight correct accurate drawing and more messy at the same time so those are opposing impulses you you should understand that right that that should be obvious what more messy i mean more more accurate and more messy those are opposites correct good so my my experiments in masking are an experiment in in that um trajectory now of course in this painting i didn't want to take time to do any drawing i just I just wanted to, this is the first, first experiment with the wax, first experiment with the rubber cement, and first experiment with the wax. Now, interesting, to me, the whole canvas right now feel, <laughs> feels like it's got wax on it. It feels kind of sticky. Let me check that out and see if there's stuff up here that I should be melting. Excuse my head. Oh yeah, there is. Or maybe I should be using a terry cloth rag. A rougher, a little rougher, a more abrasive rag. Whoops, I was out of focus, out of out of out of range there for a minute, sorry. Hmm. That's the hmm of thinking. That's a thinking hmm. Hmm. Right, so I'm getting I'm getting plenty of surprise. I'm not disappointed about that. In other words, the effect that's on the canvas right now it is not it was not predicted or controlled by me, or to the to the tiniest degree. Um, And is it a is it a good painting now? That's not a major concern, but a, a thought. Um, it's still pretty interesting. Um, it has. Whoops! There's some wax. Hang on. I just oh, where it is. There it is. Yeah, my fingers felt a pile. <laughs> Maybe my finger, I'm probably driving some of you crazy. Fingernails on a chalkboard drives me crazy, but this doesn't this sound or feel like fingernails on a chalkboard to me. So, yeah, there's some more over here. And one thing that is clear is that by doing this melting wax and rubbing it, in fact, I, I am ending up with a, a very faint layer of wax, a very thin layer of wax over the entire thing, which is not terrible. Part of the reason I chose to experiment using encaustic medium is because I know this is archival, so it won't turn color, you know, crack and fall off and so forth in years to come. Hello, Uncle. Is it working? That is the question. I'm just standing here looking. Trust me, just standing and looking. There is a lot of interesting texture happening that that uh, couldn't have happened any other way that I can think of. Um, some really, really fun stuff happening and probably too small for you to see. Here, let me pick you up for a second. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, now you can see some of the 
interesting texture. There's even some of the original cracks in the part of the reason I chose this canvas was precisely because it had cracks in it. So it was a it was a damaged canvas. But all that's doing is giving more variety to the painting, so it's perfectly fine for an abstract. Not very this this corner up here looks hmm haphazard. Looks like an accident. Doesn't look on purpose. I don't like that very much. I'm going to be a little bit mean. This looks like other people's abstract paintings. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Where it's just somebody just, you know, threw paint around. That, that is not, this is not winsome to me. The rest of this mostly is. And again, my goal with this experiment is not to produce a masterpiece. My goal is to experiment. And, and uh, I'm certainly succeeding in that realm. Sorry, I'm just still standing here thinking. Well, since I am, since I have the opportunity, then I think I'll, I'll go ahead and, and just for fun, I'll apply some more melted wax one more time. So this will be the third application. Let me show you what I'm doing here. Here's the, the bowl of melted wax. It smells wonderful. I mentioned yesterday when I was a young teenager, for a couple of years I worked with a man who made his living from honey and maple syrup fascinating work. It was quite the opportunity. I didn't appreciate it as a kid as much as I should have. But I love the smell of beeswax. Now one of the things that happened yesterday when I was applying this wax is that the wax, I don't know if you can see it running there. I like runs. And in fact, one of the things I did like about this painting before I, a little while ago, before I started, uh, before I started melting the wax, I really did like the texture that the, literally the, the these drips, the, the texture, the thickness that the, that the wax had um, put onto the, put onto the painting. That was nice. That was fun. I thought, ooh, I could do, I could. I could do that. <laughs> um, but that's that's not really the experiment I'm after, right? Good news is I don't have to wait very long at all for the um, wax to dry. It dries almost as quickly as I put it on there. All right, let's try something a little bit different. Instead of my normal liquid, let's try some Neo McGill, which this also would would um, make it difficult to do this out in the field. You know, a, a slow dry, medium, slow dry, medium. <laughs> I'm sorry, I used two meanings of the word medium in the same sentence. That's pretty bad. Um, it's not ideal. All right, up here. Let's. Just, I'm going to do some some more glazes. Nothing fancy. That's uh, Indian yellow. I love Indian yellow. Mixed, used with a glaze. I can go straight to my second favorite, maybe my most favorite glaze color, which is permanent rose, without cleaning my brush. So this has a little bit of Indian yellow still in it. Oops, need more Neil McGill. I am saying that right. This is the strangest named product in the art in the art uh, world. <laughs> Neil McGill. <laughs> Who came up with that one? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I like this corner quite a bit better now that I've glazed it. And let's go straight then to um, dioxazine violet. And again, just on a, on a brush that I did not clean. So the, the, uh, the brush had uh, yellow and red, permanent rose and Indian yellow. So the, the purple then, it, it actually turns into a bit of a brownish purple, a little bit. So mauvey purple, if you will. Mauve or mauve? What do you think? Mauve or mauve? I learned it as mauve, but then I, it seems to me I've heard some smarty pants people say, nah, it's supposed to be mauve. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I remember my first introduction to the word mauve, mauve, was from a interior decorator person in the 70s and heard it described as now I'm just going to lift off some of the glaze that I did, just some of it. I heard it described as a purplish brown, and that kind of stuck with me ever since. So in my opinion, mauve mauve is a purplish brown color. All right, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to end this broadcast here. I'm going to let this dry again, and that'll be a a, at least a day, maybe more than a day from now. Um, I want it to dry a little more thoroughly than the last time that I did this to, to ch see if, if the paint will actually stick. I'm not sure that it will because as, as I said, I think there's a very thin glaze of wax over the entire, pretty much the entire canvas from me rubbing it earlier. Tell you what, no, hang on. Before I, I'm, I might as well, I might as well try to make this a, oh, of course, an attractive painting while, while I'm at it, right? So let's take a few minutes. I'm going to redo some darks. So I'm picking up, picking up an oxide red and a dioxazine violet. Don't take notes on that. I'm just telling you. So, so this is very definitely mauve, <laughs> Pur purplish brown, dark, dark purple brown will almost look black on the canvas. Let's push the values a little bit. Now understand that all the painting I'm doing now, um, if I decide to, to come in t tomorrow or the next day, and melt all the wax off, then I don't know what's going to happen. I'm, I'm not trying to paint around. I'm ignoring the, pretty much, I'm trying to ignore the, the wax that's on the, the fresh wax that I just put there. Okay, that's part of the, the chance process. I don't really know what's going to happen. Now, another option that I do have would be to leave this last layer of wax there and just let it exist. Um, as as texture because it is it is a fascinating texture that the, the the encaustic wax medium does introduce a, a fascinating um, texture element to the painting in my opinion one of the principles of, of all painting you know, I've, I've said this in many different ways, but the, the principle of variety, and that, that's one of the, that's not one of the elements of, the, of design, that's one of the principles of design. And again, this is high school art stuff. Whereas, whereas the elements of design are a fairly carefully and agreed upon um, you know, canon, but most, most art teachers, professors, teachers agree pretty much on line shape, line shape, design, value, texture, color. Pretty much agree on, on those six, sometimes I think given as seven, those are the elements of design. The principles of design are much, much less um, 
codified or, or agreed upon. There's more, they're, they're more abstract. So, but one of the principles, in other words, principles, the principle of design, here's a good way to think about it, are the verbs, the action words. They are the things you do to the elements of design. Okay, so principles has things like tension, balance, uh, rhythm or repetition, um, and the one that I was just about to mention, variety. Those are principles of design. And in the, among the principles, the principle of variety is, is, one of the, is one of the highest in the hierarchy of, of hierarchy of principles. Variety is one that trumps almost everything else. So, simply by introducing the the various, the varied, the uh, uh, introducing the wax, especially with drips, introduces variety to the painting. Do you see? That's where I that's where I'm getting. That's where I'm trying to get at. So simply, the introduction of variety, so variety in texture. That's what I just talked about. Color, value, composition and so forth. In other words, you take the elements of design, line, shape, design, value, color, texture, shape. Oh, and sh shape is the seventh one that many, many people would add. I'm, I'm not as fired up about shape as some people, but still. But clearly, right, there's a shape, a round shape, right? And here's another shape. Um, so you should have a variety of shape since I'm on that subject. Variety of shape, variety of color, variety of texture, variety of balance, variety and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. All right, I'm going to stop right there. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, I've had two false stops in me so far this morning. What am I thinking? I, I preach this all the time, that if you're making dark marks, Pretty much of any kind. If you are making, if you're putting dark marks on your canvas, then your painting is not finished when you finished making those dark marks. All right, because you you follow up with light. So how could I forget? So I'm, let's let's follow up right now with light marks. And I'm, I'm going to start out by mixing up a pale yellow and titanium white. All right, let's just see then. And so now I'm painting with opaque paint. Let's, let me go back for a moment to the, the principle of variety. I said that the principle of variety trumps almost every other principle. It's one of the most important. And go back to one of my oft stated mantras this is a dan nelsonism okay is ain't a color made that don't look better with something else on top of it so that's my strange way of saying it using a countryfied colloquial just as a mnemonic device just to help you remember it hey, let me say it again ain't a color made that don't look better with something else on top of it now what that means in common language is that Transparent colors are more interesting than opaque colors. So that's what I mean with a color on top of it. The assumption is transparency there. Okay, that is, so that's, that's a big belief of mine. That's a big principle that I follow. Transparent colors are more interesting than opaque ones. By the way, translucent may even be more interesting than transparent, but that's for another time, okay? Um, given that principle that, again, that transparency are more, in, and by the way, this is not a matter of opinion. This is not like, well, that's your opinion. <laughs> Sorry, I have to go into that snarky voice when I'm quoting someone who disagrees. No, 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 you don't understand. No, no, this is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of physics and mathematics. <laughs> it's. A, a transparent color is much more complex, complicated, 
visually comp the light does a whole bunch more gymnastics if you will bouncing diffusing glazing sparkling off transparent color than it does off opaque okay so this is not like well that's your opinion no 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 this is scientifically literally true um, um, that doesn't mean you have to like transparent colors oh my goodness that's a completely different subject that's a subjective sillyism <laughs> you can like whatever you want doesn't matter but the fact will remain that transparent colors are more complicated than than opaque ones all right so that therefore if you take that principle at face value then a finished painting according to that statement you one would think then that a finished painting should be a finished canvas i'll say that should be covered 100 percent by transparent color correct that is correct except da, 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 enter the principle of variety and here's what i mean the principle of variety trumps almost every other rule so one rule says i'll repeat it one rule says transparent colors are more interesting and color made that don't look better with something else on top of it okay that's one principle but here's a here's another principle variety whoops so variety trumps the first principle do you see what i mean so um even though transparent colors are more interesting than opaque ones a combination of opacity and transparency gives us variety which is better than all transparent right so it's and i that's why my paintings typically when i'm doing a, one of my ordinary paintings or abstract painting for that matter like i'm doing right now i finish with um opaque colors because that gives me variety and variety is perhaps the highest value the most the most valuable the most highly valued uh principle of painting maybe i'm not i'm not sure that's literally true but we'll just leave it there for right now variety is the most the highest value of all and again that may, that may not be true but for this conversation that's essentially true all right Whew. wow well i'm glad i kept painting so i was able to get that out by the way my painting I'm, i can't believe i almost quit without doing um, some light stuff the light stuff that i've put on in the last five minutes while i've been talking has uh, improved this painting considerably one of the reasons i enjoy abstract painting so much and of course you academics get off my case <laughs> the word is actually non-objective painting it's not a there's not a painting of any object okay so the technically for the for the those in the academy <laughs> the snobs in the academy the word is non-objective right but the word abstract is so ubiquitous in our broader culture that that even though it's not accurate it is the word that most people use so i often just use the the in the common vernacular as they say use the term abstract anyway one of the reasons i enjoy <laughs> doing non-objective abstract painting is of course because you don't have to mess with painting uh, or rendering anything right which means it's an exercise in pure visuality if you will it's an exercise in pure um elements and principles of design and that's fun and in my opinion if you can't do now this is gonna be a little bit harsh so brace yourself if you can't do a good abstract painting a good and a lot of what we see out in the world are not good at they're just people messing around till something happens okay if you can't do a good abstract painting then you can't do a good representational painting either because a representational painting it has all those same elements in it 
all the same um, elements of abstract design plus a picture on top of it. So, and that's in fact why I call my my painting my normal painting technique. Um, abstract realism because the abstract elements actually are more important than the realism elements. Now let me back up. I said a minute ago, I said um, that my painting has gotten noticeably better in the last few minutes while I've been doing these light opaque bits and you would be very much within your student studential rights <laughs> to say how come what do you mean how come why is it better oh, good glad you asked one of my f f this is not an academic term but one of my favorite words and one that I use inside my mind spoken whether I speak it or not one of the words that I use in my mind all the time. That's a slight exaggeration, but so slight that we'll call it all the time. One of the prints, one of the words that I have going on in the, inside my mind the whole time while I'm painting abstract, not objective paintings, or rep, my normal quote unquote representational stuff is the word energy. Um, and energy, visual energy, is made up of all the uh, elements of design dialed up for higher energy or dialed down for lower energy. So let's take, for instance, texture, a an area of lots of texture, that's high energy, low texture, that's low. So this area right in here, texture wise, is very soft. So that's dialed down in the texture realm. This area down here, especially because of the wax drips and because of the brush strokes, I'm just messing up some of the brush strokes. Um, had too much energy, by the way. <laughs> um, it's fairly high energy. Um, this is extreme. Well, let, wait, wait, let's stick with texture. Okay, now let's go to contrast. Lights and darks close to each other. This is clearly the most intense, contrasty part of the painting. So it would probably be regarded, although this may be secondary, this may be regarded as the, the, the most highest energy in the painting because of that, all right? Color, like intense color. For instance, up here I have a bright orange that's pretty high energy. This, all this area in here is fairly moderate, so low energy with the exception of right on both sides of this drip, wax drip, there's bright red, that's high energy. Uh, so every element of design, line, shape, color, design, value, texture, dialed up, high energy, dialed down, low energy. So again, lines here, pretty high energy right there. Then there's all this feathery lines. I've got pencils, and color, red pencils and black pencils and brown pencils way in there, real subtle lines, so low energy, get it? Um, so in the last several minutes, again, I said that with the, with the addition of these light, opaque bits that I've applied, I've increased the overall energy of the painting considerably. Now listen to this, high energy does not equal high quality. Okay, just because you increase, just because I increased um, the energy doesn't mean that the painting got better. Why? Because if all high energy everywhere is the virtual definition of a bad painting. Let me say that again. High energy line, energy, shape, design, composition, value, texture, color. If it's high energy everywhere, it's just a mess. It's just a, it's just chaos. All right. So high energy does not mean good quality. It's balance. So that's again, balance. That would be one of the principles of design. Balance is what you do to the elements of design. So um, before I started this white stuff, there, the, the painting was a little bit too calm everywhere. So I have, I've popped up the energy of this painting 
uh, in, in select areas. So if I were to continue popping up the energy, I would at some point in the not too distant future, I would step over a line into, whoops, now my painting has too much energy. Does that make sense? But the way it was before I started this, the, these uh, opaque bits, um, there was a little bit too little energy everywhere. Now, I know one thing I am doing right now, I promise you, is, <laughs> is I am um, painting as if there is no wax. I've forgotten, so to speak. I've forgotten all about my wax underpainting. So if tomorrow or the next day when I melt it off, I'm going to be I'm going to be set for a big surprise. Of course, there's a possibility I'm just going to leave the wax there and just say no. That's that's part of my new, at least in the non-objective abstract world, that's part of my new shtick. Is I put I put melted wax on my paintings. <laughs> I'm not telling you that that's what I'm going to do, but I'm telling you that's a possibility. Especially if I come upstairs to my, to my studio here tomorrow and look at this painting and go, oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm going to do that, but if I do, you know, there's a decent chance I'll say, okay, leave it. All right, um, let, let me do one more thing because it's an easy teach. Um, what color is this painting mostly? Okay, you should you should be saying something like orange, yellow. You could say orange and purple. That's good. Mostly. All right. What's the opposite of orange? Uh, purple. The answer would be blue or green. I'm not going to go all the way to blue. I might, but um, I'm going to uh, play a very common pull on a very common principle for me in my abstract paintings. In fact, if you go to my website, which is dannelsonart.com, I have, um, I'm trying to remember now, maybe over 200, maybe less than 200 abstract paintings on my, you can find them easily, dannelsonart.com. And you'll notice that I, I play this game very often in my abstract paintings. That is to say, I introduce typically late in the process, although there is already green underneath here. So what I'm doing right now is not, not terribly shocking because there's already green on the canvas. Um, but I will, what I'm doing now is entering a strong element of variety in the color realm. In fact, I'm going to do one more right before I leave, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I really am going to quit this, this time in just a minute. And that is, I'm again, I'm going to, along the same line, I'm going to add a little more variety. So I just added green, but I did it. There was already a, several green bits here and there. Then I added. Let's see if I can count them. One. I'm not sure I added those two. Yeah, that one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten little touches of green. Okay, ten. I hit double digits. That, that's a fair amount. There's still no blue uh, worth talking about on anywhere on the on the painting. And of course, I could leave it like that and say this is a decidedly warm painting. It's warm, 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 warm. There is no blue on the spin. That would be perfectly legitimate. You can tell by the way I'm talking. I'm, I'm leading up to not doing that. I have here a piece of cardboard and I'm going to... It's pretty important that where I put this blue. Drag it a tiny bit. There we go. And maybe, maybe one more touch where I put this. Okay, I, 
one more. It's so easy to overdo this. So this is a, the most a various color. I'm not sure the language fails here. I'll tell you what, I'm going to change the color slightly, slightly different color, a little bit more ultramarine, so slightly darker, slightly cooler blue. So it's not exactly the same as what's here. That was Thalo, by the way. And I'm going to introduce one mark right there and smudge it a little bit. Whew. Even if you hear if you're hearing me talking, I hope somebody up there who does abstract or wants to do abstract painting is listening to me, because even the way I've been talking, verbalizing for the last, oh, I'm gonna do one more thing. <laughs> Okay, once again, I lied at you. <laughs> um, the way I've been talking for the last many minutes is a, as I think about it now, is a good reflection of what I mean. And I'm not saying that I'm doing a great painting or that I'm doing, that the painting I'm doing is, is a masterpiece. But the process that you hear coming out through my verbiage reflects, I'm convinced of this, reflects a good mindset. In other words, this is the kind of stuff you indeed should be thinking about when you're doing, you don't have to use the same words by any means, but many of these, the impulses you hear me reflecting in my language should be a part of your impulses. You paint. All right, I just, there was purple down there. There was a, a like a, a violet bar and and I just reinforced that uh, a good deal with a with a bit of clean purple and fairly hard edge. I I felt like the painting had lots of energy up here. See, not quite enough down here. So with that violet purple bar, I I pulled some. Of the, I balanced the energy just a little bit. Balance is not what it's all about, by the way. Like fifty fifty hazy hazy. No 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 no. I want more energy. I want my energy off center. I don't want energy here. That would be a bad composition. See? Energy here, good. But too much here compared to here, not good. So I just boom, it dawned on me. Wait, 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 wait. Let's pull this let's pull the painting down a little bit. So I increase the energy by two things. Color and edges, hard edges, contrast. Alright? That's a pretty nice abstract painting. I'm going to boldly say. That is a pretty nice abstract painting. And I have no idea. I like it well enough that I think, oh, I'd be ashamed to <laughs> come in here and melt it. Now that I've worked so hard, see, this is what I wanted to avoid. <laughs> I've, I've painted myself into the proverbial corner because my experiment now is over because I like my painting too much. I don't want to experiment anymore. And I, I will make that decision tomorrow or the next day, whenever, next time I come up to my, up to this studio. But I, again, I hope that the way that I'm talking, and I don't mean everything that I've said, no, 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 no I'm not defending every thought that I've had, I'm, I, but I am defending the process, the, the mental process that you've heard reflected in my verbiage, by the way. Back to the green. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> that's not an artist bragging, that's an artist going, re reacting like, ooh, I thought that might look nice, but doggone it does. I'm just standing back and looking with my head cocked to one side. Do you believe me? You want to see me? See? Proof. <laughs> head cocked to one side. <laughs> All right, who's talking to me here? Let me see. Uncle Sixty. Gamlin tells a beeswax in pastel medium. Ooh. That's a thought, Uncle. Thank you. <laughs> it's a bike tire. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> we can't help seeing it. It's kind of cattywampus. It's not perfectly round. <laughs> Our brains, we, we really can't help seeing pictures, can we? 
Uh, um, by the way, since I'm, again, maybe this has been slightly instructive um, for some of you who are, who are working on um, abstract painting. Um, that brings up a good point. The human mind cannot help but see pictures in any abstract texture. You know, if, if there's enough busyness around, we're going to see stuff. Um, and in my opinion, which of course is correct, <laughs> in my opinion, um, as an abstract painter, you actually want to steer away from that. You don't want to feed that. You want to say, well, it looks kind of like a old man smoking a pipe. So then you do a few things to look up, make it look, because that is actually getting people away from non-objective painting. You, they, they're going to do it anyway. You can't help that. But I don't think you want to help them um, see pictures in, in the abstraction. Because the, the idea is for them not to see pictures, but to see purely line shape, color design, value texture, in, in tension, in balance, in variety, and so forth. That's what the message of the painting is. It's not, can you find the hidden picture? They will do that anyway. You can't, you can't stop that. And it's okay if they derive, if they derive pleasure from that. I just realized, I, I keep, again, I keep saying, all right, so I've got the same color purple essentially going all the way from here, fuzzed out all the way here. And as many of you know, that's not a pleasant sensation. So I'm going to do my normal old thing, which is mix up a slightly lighter version of that purple and paint some of this. It's not light enough. Paint some of this purple with a slightly lighter and then, then it won't feel like to the viewer. And they, they can't verbalize this because they don't know what they're experiencing. It's my job to know the effect that my painting will have on the human eye, mind, psyche. It's not the, it's not their job. It's not the it's not the observer's job to understand. It's my job to understand as the artist to understand the effect that everything. Okay, that's better. That's better. Principle of variety. See, same colored purple all the way across. Eh. Now two shades of purple, more variety, better painting. Right? If I were consistent, I would do the same thing with the blue, but I think I'm okay because that's a different color blue than that, and that's, a, that's such a small piece. I think I'm okay letting it stay one color. <laughs> do you hear my talk? But that is the kind of thing you discuss within yourself. This broadcast has gone on a whole lot longer than I thought it would. I thought, man, 15 minutes and I'll be done. There you go. I just never know when to quit. standing here with my head cocked to the side. <laughs> you want to see me? No, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> and now that you know it's true, we can just let it go at that. Yeah, it's a nice abstract painting. I'll, I'll say that. I have no idea if I'll come back and try melting that wax off or not. It is a, it's a, it's a pleasant look. Oh, and Uncle asked a very good question. Will it cost? Will it cause adherence issues? And that is a good question. It, it could be broken off. There's no question about that. Then, on the other hand, uh, this wax, when it's cool, I've wondered, by the way, about uh, related subject. I store a lot of my paintings in the attic. That's right behind you guys, right back there. I've, I've finished out an attic quite extensively with bins for, I have dozens of paintings up there. And in the summer, of course, it gets quite hot. And I have wondered about that, the effect of that often. My paintings, some have been out there for years. <laughs> I need to get rid of them, burn them, cut them out, make bookmarks out of them, something. But um, they do not seem to have suffered any deleterious effects, <laughs> sorry for the big word, um, from being out there. But I have often wondered, yeah, but what about encaustics? I don't think they would do well at 100 degrees or 150 degrees. I think it would melt. So I do have that concern. Anyway, I have rambled long enough. Thanks again for your company. I appreciate it. And uh, if I do anything else exciting today, I will sure to bring you on board. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.